Hi, welcome back to 5 Minute Physics, the second last episode. Um, I'm, uh, it's okay that I ran out of paper for my, uh, in the last uh, episode because I won't need it for today or tomorrow. I made some notes for myself. Today, I want to extend, yesterday I ended with some black hole paradoxes. And I thought it'd be appropriate today to talk about open questions more generally. Namely, the things I would like to know that we don't know which one might call the big questions, but I, I, I want to preface this by saying you should be incredibly leery of, of discussions of the big ideas or big questions by institutions or people. Um, it's not the way physics is, is, is generally progresses. And usually there's an agenda, either self-promotion or in the case of, say, the Templeton Foundation pushing some loony ideas about science and God. The point is that, that Science, physics proceeds on the whole by baby steps. In fact, often we don't even know that a big development has been made till later. Einstein didn't, didn't develop special relativity and general relativity because he was interested in some new, developing some new notions of space and time. He was instead interested in addressing ultimately a question having to do with electromagnetism and trying to understand what happened in one case when you, if you ran along with a light ray and trying to resolve some inconsistencies between Galileo and Maxwell. So he's trying to answer a question about electromagnetism. His paper was originally called electro, related to electrodynamics on the, electro, on the electrodynamics of moving bodies. And in general relativity, he wasn't looking, again, for a grand theory of space and time. He was driven to it. He was trying to answer the question, trying to understand the equivalence principle, the weird fact that there was a relationship between acceleration and gravity. And it drove him kicking and screaming ultimately to understand it as a theory of space and time and he had to learn a lot of geometry to do it. The developers of quantum mechanics, Bohr, Heisenberg, Schrodinger, Einstein as well and Planck weren't again driven by developing some new law, some fundamental new, new laws about how momentum and time and energy work. They were trying to understand the electromagnetic spectra of atoms and how electro, elect fields inter, and particular light interacts with matter and then they were driven to that. Even the, the unifiers of the, of the weak and electromagnetic interaction were not driven by some grand notion of unification. They were trying to understand how to understand a theory, the weak interaction, which appeared inexplicable. And the hope was by somehow relating it to electromagnetism, you might be able to come up with an, a theory that you, you could actually calculate with and make predictions with. And in fact, speaking of baby steps, Weinberg's paper uh, on, on the unified the unification of the electroweak theory uh, which is now one of the most cited papers in physics, at the time, for many years afterwards, didn't get a single citation. So, so the key thing that drives physicists are not grand ideas so much. They're in the background. It may make you sound profound to talk about time or the nature of time or, or the interpretation of quantum mechanics, but that's not what drives physics. What drives physics is questions about phenomena and, and puzzles and paradoxes. That's why the black hole paradoxes that I talked about I thought were important. So having said that, I wanna, I wanna at least talk about what I think are, are, are the important outstanding questions that interest me. And, and you know, they, they're parochial. The first one has to do with dark matter. I hope that we, we will understand in this, in this century, maybe while I'm still around, what forms the dark matter in the universe. A lot of people say, well, why do you, you know, why do you think there's dark matter? Why do you think gravity, the nature of gravity changes? And the point is that dark matter is, is the most conservative assumption. Almost every theory beyond the standard model predicts particles that would have been created in the early universe that are weakly interacting. As I've often said, if you look around, there are a billion photons for every proton in the universe, but we didn't even know those billion photons existed. We didn't even know the microwave background existed until 1965. Clearly, if there are particles that were created in the early universe that interact less strongly than light, we, it, we wouldn't have yet discovered them. And I've spent a lot of my career trying to propose experiments to try and discover them. And my interest isn't so much, frankly, in the astrophysics. Of course, dark matter is fundamental to understanding of the formation of, of galaxies and, and, and large-scale structure in the universe. But my interest is the fact that if we discover the nature of dark matter, it can determine directly detect those particles it will give us a handle on fundamental particle physics beyond the realm in which we can do, understand in accelerators and push us forward. We're presently waiting for some new evidence that will tell us, that will allow us to move forward in our fundamental understanding. And I think dark matter is one of the best options 
who are trying to do that. And that's one of the reasons why I've spent so much time trying to understand or develop ideas that might help um, uh, experimentally detect it. And, and have been involved now in, in several experimental collaborations to do that. The, net, the second issue, of course, is dark energy, which has been close to my heart and, and mind for many, many years. I, I think that is the biggest outstanding mystery in fundamental physics. I also think it's the most difficult one. When I first argued that there was dark energy in, 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 uh, that might dominate the, the mass density of the universe, or the energy density of the universe, in the early 90s, I did it because I thought the experiments were wrong. I, I really felt that the idea was so crazy that this stuff couldn't really exist. But it, 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 it does, and it did. And, and it, the fact that it's so crazy is exciting, but it also confronts really our fundamental understanding of quantum field theory and gravity. And for that reason, I think it, it's unlikely that we'll resolve that problem until we have a better ha way of understanding quantum gravity, and I think that could be a long way off. That's if it's fundamental. It would be interesting to know if this energy we see in empty space isn't fundamental. Uh, I suspect it is, and I think that's, by the way, one of the biggest failures, if you wish, of string theory, or as a, as a proposed quantum theory of gravity, is that it really hasn't, it hasn't given us any insights into the nature of dark energy, and I ultimately think a theory of quantum gravity will be required to understand why the energy of empty space gravitates and doesn't gravitate more than it does. And that, that is a question I, I made a bet with Stephen Hawking and my friend Frank Wolchek, I think in 2003 at a conference I organized, that we wouldn't understand the nature of dark energy of, uh, uh, with, for a decade, and we haven't. And, um, and I'm not convinced we'll understand it in this century. What is probably needed is a good idea, and good ideas are few and far between, as I'll get to. The next notion that would, I'd like to know something about or is, is, are there extra dimensions in nature? I mean, extra dimensions are, are uh, all in vogue, and, and are in some sense almost demanded by string theory. But I want to remind you that there isn't a scrap, not one single bit of experimental evidence of, for extra dimensions. There's not one experiment that suggests there are extra dimensions in nature. And that should, that should put all of this in perspective. It, it, there well could be. There are a lot of good theoretical reasons for thinking that there might be, but no good experimental reasons. And, and the point is that we should remember that most theories are wrong. Most new theories, even elegant, beautiful theories, are wrong. If they weren't, then anyone could do physics. So string theory is extremely well motivated, as I've said, and other ideas are well motivated too. But nature will choose, and maybe, and if history is any guide, the ultimate answer may be none of the, none of the above. And, and we have to remember that. I'd like to understand black hole evaporations and ultimately black, then it, obviously the, the problems I talked about before the paradoxes that relate it to black holes. Do black holes exist as we think they are? Do, do the, does the physics have to change when we talk about singularities? Because that's relevant not just to black holes, but the origins of the universe. Something that's a little less grand, perhaps, involves quantum computing, which relies on some of the paradoxes I've talked about, and not paradoxes, but weird nature of quantum mechanics. Quantum computing is a fascinating idea, and the question I have is, will it be practical? Will it allow us to build practical computers that allow us to address questions we can't with class classical computers? And I'm agnostic at this point. I think there's, a, there's been a lot of hype, but it's not clear to me that they're going to get there. But if they do, what interests me most is what quantum computer, computers may allow us to understand about fundamental physics, about quantum mechanics itself, because quantum computers will allow us to test quantum mechanics in domains we haven't been able to do otherwise, and maybe will reveal to us ideas of quantum mechanics. That's the reason that R Richard Feynman first talked about quantum computers, because he said maybe a quantum computer could help him understand quantum mechanics. And he was one of the people who understood quantum mechanics about as well as anyone else. I'd like to know, as I've talked about, whether the forces in nature are really unified. There's certainly a lot of indirect evidence that the three non-gravitational forces in nature come together. We haven't been able to find a unified theory that yet makes predictions that agree with observations, but it smells right. And I'd like to know if they get unified, and of course, then that would suggest even more strongly that perhaps the gravity gets unified with the other forces of nature. And in that, in that way, looking for physics beyond the standard model, I've always been fascinated by neutrinos my whole life. I've written many papers on neutrino physics. Neutrinos may be a portal to understand physics beyond the standard model. They already are. They have a mass, and, and a neutrino mass is not a natural part of the standard model. But maybe they'll understand other, help us understand other things. There's, Maybe the properties of neutrinos were related to C and P 
violation will help us understand the origins of baryons in the universe. There's some new interesting work in that regard and we'll see. But I think neutrino physics is fascinating. Unfortunately, it's hard to measure and just measuring certain properties of neutrinos may not themselves give us enough clues to go beyond the standard model effectively. The last question that interests me the most, in some sense, is the question that interested Einstein, which is, is our universe unique? When I was growing up and wanted to be a physicist, I was interested in the question, why are the laws of nature the way they have to be, and what are those ultimate laws? That's what certainly drove me into physics. But now we understand that that may not be a good question. It could be that there are no ultimate laws. It could be that our universe isn't unique, that the other universes could exist with different laws. You know, it used to think that if we tweaked one of the laws of nature, then suddenly a universe couldn't exist. But it could be, and ideas of the multiverse suggest that there may, in fact, that may not be the case. There may be may, many, many universes. And each of them may have different laws of physics. We don't know. And I, I kind of would like to know that. Again, it's not clear we'll know that. And though there are arguments for at least understanding indirectly whether a multiverse might exist, experiments we might be able to do to detect that. The way Einstein framed that was by, in one of his sentences, where he didn't mean what he said. He said the question that really interested him was whether God had any choice in the creation of the universe. And by that, he didn't mean God or creation. He meant, is our universe unique? And when we talk about physicists spouting grand notions, we should, we should be careful of what they really mean. And Einstein certainly didn't mean, when he mentioned God, anything for him more than the amazing fact that the universe seems to be explicable. And the amazing fact that the universe seems to be explicable for us humans should motivate us to try and understand it and keep working and not giving up. Okay, that's it for today and tomorrow I'm going to talk about what I think are the two most important legacies that physics gives the rest of the world. Thanks. Take care.